Hi, I'm Brandon Bowers, pastor of New Life Church, located in Locust, North Carolina. Now, I wanted to say thanks for stopping by and checking out our YouTube channel. I hope that today's message is both encouraging and challenging to you and your walk with Christ. If you're in our area sometime, we would love to have you come check out one of our services each and every Sunday at 845, 1015, and 1145. We'd love to have you come out. And I hope that you enjoy today's message. It's hard to believe, especially on a day like this where the humidity is already up as high as it is. But we're almost at the end of summer. Kids are getting ready to go back to school before long. My daughter started band camp last week. And before you know it, it's going to be Labor Day. And with that, around here at New Life comes something that we call We Are Here Week. If you're new to New Life, uh, maybe you weren't here last year, perhaps you've seen all of the older t-shirts that say we are here week on it, perhaps you've wondered what that's all about. That's our time where we go out with our ministry partners and we serve in the community, we serve with our ministry partners. Several years ago, Pastor Brandon was having a conversation with someone and the person made the statement, I never knew that new life was here. And that got him started thinking, you know, how can we let, know, let people know that we're here? And so out of that was born the idea of We Are Here Week. Along with that, most of the time, we'll have a series running into that that ties in our core values, why we're new life, why we do what we do, love, service, truth, worship, community, generosity, all those values that make us what we are. And this year is, is no difference. Today we'll start a series that's going to run for the next seven weeks called Influence. Influence is defined as the capacity or the ability to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. And so to be a church that is going to have that kind of influence, that kind of impact, on our communities. We need for each of us here that, that make up New Life, we need for every one of you to recognize that you have influence, to put that influence into action and to have an, a positive effect on the world around you. And as the church, we want to do so much more than just have a positive impact, right? God's got so much more in store for us than that. As, as Christians, we're called to make a positive impact, a positive influence for Christ. It might be hard to see unless you're up here closer to the stage. I've got a box of dominoes up here with me. And I don't know if you've ever played dominoes or not. I was probably in the Navy already before I realized that there was an actual uh, game called dominoes with, with rules and scoring in it. I just thought like maybe some of y'all, you know, growing up, as, as kids, we would set up as many dominoes in a row as we could and try to knock them all down in some sort of creative way. You may not know this, but there is actually something called World Domino Day. World Domino Day. And people all around the world, there's all kinds of world records for what they call domino toppling, for setting up dominoes in various combinations and knocking them down. The world record for an individual, one person setting up dominoes, knocking them all over, is just over 321,000. That's impressive, right? I mean, how long does it take to set up and knock, set up 321,000 dominoes? But for a group, for a group of people, and it didn't specify how many people are in the group, but for a group, 4.4 million dominoes were knocked over. I mean, that's just insane. And for some people, it's not just about how many dominoes they can knock over, there's a creative element to it as well. Instead of using actual dominoes, some people have set up things like bars of soap, CD cases, Bic lighters, cereal boxes. Get this, I don't know who would go to the time to do all this, they toasted bread and they set up toast and knocked it all over. And then this may be one for our students for In Motion, they took people and strapped them to mattresses, all right, and knocked them all over. That sounds like it might be a little bit of fun. 
right? But no matter what they use, no matter what is being knocked over, they all start out the same way with this one domino. And, and, and before it is touched, there's nothing but potential. But once that first domino is, is touched, it sets off a chain reaction that, that has a ripple effect. And so I, since I didn't have enough time or room on the stage to set up 321,000 dominoes for you this morning. I know that you'll appreciate that. I just wanted to show you a short video clip. And the one that I chose, I mean, you can look this up on YouTube. There's domino toppling videos all over the place. It's crazy. But I chose one. There's only 13 dominoes in this chain. But I want you to check out the first domino in the chain and then the chain reaction that results from the first domino. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes. But what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes, and the largest domino it weighs about 100 pounds ugh, and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. Wow. Did you catch that? I mean, the first domino, five millimeters by one millimeter thick, tiny. The guy had to set it up with tweezers. But as the impact spreads, as the influence grows, it continues to knock down larger and larger things. And sometimes, if you think about it, our lives are like those dominoes. Once we're set in motion, once our life is set in motion, we don't really have any idea how the ripple effect of our actions will carry through to others. They may have unimaginable power that we could never envision. Last week I was reading this story. It was about a, uh, a young man. His name was Miles Eckert. You may have read this. I mean, it was on CBS News, but, but this, guy, this young man, he was only eight years old. And he was going out with his family to Cracker Barrel for dinner one night, and as he got out of his car, he found a $20 bill in the parking lot. And like most eight-year-olds or 80-year-olds, all of us, as he was walking into the Cracker Barrel, he was thinking, how can I, you know, how can I use this money? What am I going to spend this $20 on? But as he gets into the Cracker Barrel, he sees something that, that changes uh, his plans. He sees a service member in, in uniform. And so he decides to give the service member his $20, and he writes a note to him. The note said this, My dad was a soldier. He's in heaven now. I found this $20 in the parking lot when we got here. We like to pay it forward in my family, and it's your lucky day. Thank you for your service. And the boy signed the note, Miles Eckert, a gold star kid. I don't know if you've heard this term before, a gold star kid, but going all the way back to World War I, people would fly pennants, flags outside their house. If they had someone in their house serving in the military, they would put for each person a blue star on the flag. And if someone in that family died, then their star was changed from blue to gold. He was a gold star kid. He was, you see, his dad at 24 years of age, was a sergeant in the army, and he had died in Iraq just weeks before Miles was born. He never knew his dad, and so the impact of that rippling through his life, he wanted to give something back to this service member, and the colonel who he gave it to took the boy's note, and he put it on the internet, and he never would have guessed, but it went, it went viral. People started sending money to them. Their phone rang so much they, that they disconnected their phone. CBS did a news story on them. 
And every time they would receive money, they would take the money and they would donate it to some organization that benefited military service members. Over $2 million. This year, Miles received a Young Heroes Award from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. And his family plans to start a foundation that is going to continue to raise money for children that have lost family members, service members, and other ways to help military service members killed in combat. And his mother said this, Miles made a choice that day, and the ripple effect has been never-ending. The momentum behind the story is not over yet. And she tells her children, we're ordinary people who have been given an extraordinary opportunity to touch the world and positively impact lives. That's influence. Miles was only eight years old. He had absolutely no idea what was going to happen after he gave this $20 to this service member. He just wanted to do something nice. Our lives are like that. I mean, he didn't take the time to think, I'm too young, I'm too insignificant, I don't matter, I don't make a difference. He just did what he did with no expectations, and the ripple effects are still continuing. Your lives are like that. That's the truth that I want to get across to you today. I want you to start thinking about as we go through this series. You are a person of influence. Jesus talked about influence in, uh, in the Christian life, and he talked about this uh, several times, but the place I want to think about today was in his message on the sermon on the, that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. He had gone up on a hillside, and his disciples gathered around, and in chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus said this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God, your Father, who is in heaven." This morning, I just want to share three truths with you about your influence. As I said, you are a person of influence. As the crowds were following Jesus and they came to him uh, on the mountain, on the hillside, and they sat down and he began to teach, his primary audience were those people that were already committed to following him. But there were crowds, and in this crowd would have been religious leaders, uh, political leaders, fathers, mothers, children, businessmen, tax collectors, fishermen, people of all ages, all walks of life, all would have heard this message. And note what he didn't say. He didn't say, you may be salt, or you have the potential to be salt. He said, no. In verses 13 and 14, you are the salt. You are the light. You see, he was making a statement of truth. He was making a description that, des that described his followers. He was talking to them, and by extension, he's talking to us still today, all that have given our life to Christ. We are salt. We are light. And we think of salt, when you think of salt, primarily as a seasoning. But especially in the, in the biblical world, salt had usages other than just seasoning. Primarily, it would have been used as a preservative. No refrigeration, it was used to preserve meat. It was also a purifying agent, and it could be used, or it was used, as a part of sacrifices. Given the amount of salt needed to preserve meat, it's likely that the disciples, his followers, would have thought of a preser preservative before they would have thought of a seasoning. He's calling his, his disciples to be agents of redemption, preventing moral decay in the world around them. I know you all probably already know what an agent is. It's a person that represents another individual or business. For instance, my cousin's wife is a travel agent. Last year, we went on a cruise, and I called my cousin and said, this is where we want to go. 
this is the date she want to go, we want to go. She contacted the cruise line on our behalf. She arranged our cabins. She arranged the best price. She took care of everything. She acted on our behalf. She represented us to the cruise line. We're Jesus' representatives to the world. All right? Jesus is the only one who has the authority, who has the power to redeem. But we act and we represent on his behalf pointing people to Christ. That's influence. But he adds a note of caution. Salt that has lost its taste is useless. Sounds strange, doesn't it? How could salt, have you ever noticed salt losing its taste, losing its flavor? It doesn't. Pure salt doesn't lose its taste. However, in ancient times again, the salt was much more impure than what we have today. And the sodium chloride, that which we know as salt, could leach out of the impure salt, leaving behind a substance that was tasteless. So the more impurities that entered, the more impure the salt was, it rendered it useless as an agent of preservation. It could no longer do what it was designed to do. When Christians can no longer be distinguished from non-Christians, when we allow ourselves to be corrupted by the influences of the world as opposed to influencing others, we become useless as agents of redemption. Jesus also said, you are light, we're light. Lights aren't designed to be hidden. Who turns on a light and then covers it up? Unless you have kids in the house. Then I don't know if y'all have the same problem that we do. Uh, the switches on the wall go up, but they don't necessarily go down. So lights will be throughout the house for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do. They're, they're impractical. They're not being used. However, as Christians, we are designed for our lives to be seen. We're designed to interact with others. We're designed to have an influence and impact on others. So start thinking about the people that you have influence with. Maybe use your notes to write down some people. You may have brothers and sisters. Perhaps uh, if you're married, you've got your spouse. If you're still a student, you go to school, uh, you've got classmates. Maybe you're on a sports team or in the band. You, you have teammates. If you already have a job, you have coworkers. Even if you're uh, independently self-employed, you have people that you deal with, people that you work with on a daily basis. You have other family, some of them close, far away. You have friends. Some of you are already part of a life group. The average person in here, if you start thinking about it, the average person anywhere has influence on 40 to 50 people. And if you start taking that each person that you know has influence on an additional 40 to 50 people, then you start seeing how your influence ripples out beyond what you could ever expect it to. You have influence. The Bible also reminds us that we don't always use our influence in a positive way. One of the examples is found in the book of Galatians chapter 5. New people were giving their lives to Christ and they were being influenced by false teachers who were convincing them that they had to be circumcised, convincing them that they needed to take on and be obligated to Jewish law. And so in chapter 5 verse 9, Paul makes this statement. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. If you think about yeast, yeast itself is neither good nor bad. Scripture uses it in, in both ways, positive and negative. If you look uh, in the book of Matthew in chapter 13, uh, a parable that Jesus tells, it's used to describe the effect, the spread of the kingdom of God. A few chapters later in chapter 16, it's used as a warning. Jesus warns his disciples, don't be influenced by the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In either case, in either usage, positive or negative, here's the principle. The principle is that yeast expands, yeast grows, yeast spreads. And in the same way, our influence, if we choose to use it, will grow. It will expand. And we get the choice. 
how we're going to use it. We get the choice. Truth number one, can, you know, go out of here with this this week. You are a person of influence. Leads to truth number two. You can increase your influence. There's not a lot recorded in, in the Bible about Jesus' early life. But one of the examples I'll take you to this morning is in the book of Luke in chapter 2. Jesus has gone with his family into the temple. It's, it's the time of Passover. And after the Passover meal is left, Mary and Joseph, they're, they're heading back to Nazareth. And they realize that Jesus is no longer with them. And so they have to turn around. They go back to the city. And they spend three days looking, trying to find where, where Jesus is. And on that third day, they return to the temple. They find him there, and he's with the teachers in the temple. And the teachers are amazed at Jesus' understanding and his answers. So in, in verse 52 of chapter 2, Luke writes this, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's growing. That's increasing in influence. We know that Jesus was about 30 years old when his public ministry began. Prior to that time, he was mostly known as the carpenter's son. The people in his hometown knew him that way. But it came a point in his ministry where he returned to Nazareth, and he goes to the temple. And as he is teaching, the people are astounded at, at his teaching. They're astounded the way that he teaches with authority. Where did he get this wisdom from? Yes, Jesus is fully God. He has that advantage, but still, he was, don't forget, he was fully man as well. And he had spent 30 years preparing for his earthly ministry. He had spent 30 years learning and growing so that when he began to preach and teach, people were amazed, the crowds were astounded, and they followed him because he taught as one with authority. Two things that I want you to take away, things that we can do to increase our influence. First, learn. Never stop learning. Be a lifelong learner. As your knowledge increases, so will your influence. Aside from Google, what do you do when you're at school or you're at your job and you run into a problem and you need some advice? You know, around here, I'll go see, you know, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Tony, Pastor Trey, Pastor Evan, you know, one of, one of the other staff members, and I'll ask their advice because they may have uh, information pertaining to the problem I'm trying to solve. Those people have influence in my life. The people that you go to that have knowledge have influence in your life. So be willing to learn and take on new ideas. It's a biblical principle. If you look in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 15 says this, Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. During this season, or during this series, I hope that you'll be open to new ideas. Perhaps you've been here, you've never taken notes on our messages. Start taking notes. Take those home. Share them with your family. Spend some time during the week studying and applying the messages from Sunday. Perhaps you've never been involved in a life group. Make this the week. I'll give you the opportunity later. Make this the week that you become involved in a life group. What do you do when people ask you why you what do you say when people ask you why do you attend New Life? Anybody? I like to tell people this. Do you know our mission here at New Life? Our mission is to give people that are far from God the opportunity to experience new life in Christ. That's why me and my family are here. As soon as we came here and we heard that that's what the vision and mission of this church was, we were all on board with that. You know why? Because years ago, I was one of those people far from God, who's had the opportunity to experience new life in Christ. I'm passionate about that. That's why I attend New Life Church. Do you know our core values, as I mentioned earlier? Love, service, truth, worship, community, generosity. Can you tell people 
why those things are important to you. We want you to be bought into God's vision for New Life Church, to be a part of all God's doing here, to help you reach your God-given potential. And we believe that it's important for you to continue to learn, continue to grow, continue to expand your influence. Be a lifelong learner. And second, lead. Be the one that sets the examples for others. Think about the leaders that you know today throughout history. How did they use their influence, positively or negatively? A lot of them, I mean, you can see this today. They use their influence in a negative way. They use their influence to deceive. They use their influence to manipulate. But the greatest leaders, the one that have had the most influence, have done the most good, have this in common. They use their influence to serve others. It's the example that Jesus set. Think about it. As he was at the Passover meal, he was on his way to crucifixion. Everyone was reclining at the table together, and Jesus realized that no one had washed their feet. What did he do? He went, he took up the basin himself. He took up the towel himself. He washed the feet of his disciples. And then he said this in John 13, verses 14 through 16. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Learning is great, but it's not enough just to know. You have to be willing to do to act. Jesus showed his disciples a better way. He showed them a better way. He said this in Matthew 23, verse 11. Do you want to stand out? Then step down. Be a servant. You want to talk about something that stands out in the world today? Go out and start serving others selflessly. They look at you like you're crazy. I mean, this is just a tiny thing, but several years ago, the company I was working for is in San Diego. I had went out there on a business trip, left the hotel in the morning, went by Starbucks, got a cup of coffee. As I was leaving the restaurant, or leaving the Starbucks, there were several other people coming in. I held the door open for them. Didn't say a word, just held the door open. As they went into Starbucks, the people behind the cash register said this, you must not be, around, be from around here, are you? I kid you not. Imagine what they would have, how they would have responded if I had actually done something significant. They simply weren't used to seeing people look out for other people, to do nice things, to serve others. It was unexpected. Here's my question for you. How can you serve more people in a positive way? Remember, you get to choose. You get to choose because that's our final truth that I want to share with you. You're a person of influence. You can increase your influence, and you choose how to use your influence. God gives us the freedom to choose, and you can use your influence in a positive way or a negative way. Let's think about, again, some, some public figures, and I'll give you a chance to play along. I'm going to you know, call out a name, and you tell me, uh, good influence or bad influence? We'll start with a couple easy ones. Billy Graham. Mother Teresa. Adolf Hitler. Bad. Osama bin Laden. You don't even need to think about these. It's, it's obvious what kind of influence and impact they had. But what about a couple more difficult ones? Howard Schultz is the chairman and CEO of Starbucks. I chose this one just for Anita. Although he wasn't the original owner, he was responsible for turning it into the business that it is today. Good or bad? I get a few goods, I get a few bads, I get you know, a few non-comments. I mean, you know, it, it's a little more difficult to choose on this one. What about this one? Lance Armstrong. Again, chuckles, some good, some bad. Overcame, he's a cancer survivor, started the Live Strong Foundation, won Tour de France uh, 
bicycle race seven times. Seemed really good, a positive influence. But then it comes out of all the doping and everything that went into making him who he was on the Tour de France. That's not so good. Good or bad. Today, Livestrong still lives on as a foundation under gen different management, and it's still fighting the battle against cancer. So there is still a positive influence there. Like many things in life, we will make the decision about whether something is a positive influence or a negative influence based on whether or not they have the same beliefs and values that we do. Now think about your own influence. I imagine that you want to be a good influence. It's likely that you know how to be a good influence, that you know the right choices to make. But when we're out there all alone and it comes time to make the decision, we don't always make the right choice. It's a battle. Paul describes it this way in Romans 7, verse 21. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Your translation may say, evil is right there with me. We know the right thing to do. But that sin nature inside of us is a constant battle, constantly pushing us to do what we know isn't good. It's no easier for me to choose than it is for you to choose. I don't always make the right choice. It's a battle. But this I know. This never changes. Making the right choice starts with this. Committing your life to Christ. Following Jesus is the most powerful form of influence in the world. You get the choice whether to live as according to his teachings, according to his manner of life. That's what a disciple of Christ is. That's what a follower of Christ does. And it's a choice that only you get to make. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is one of my favorite leaders is Joshua. The Old Testament uh, in chapter 24, it tells this story. His life is coming to an end. He knows that he doesn't have long to live. He gathers all the leaders of Israel around him, and he reminds them, first of all, he reminds them of all that God has done. God has driven out their enemies. He's given them their land. He's given them cities that they didn't have to build. He's given them food and produce of the land they didn't have to plant. All the good that God has done, he reminds them. But he knows, he knows that there are still going to be battles against whether to do right or whether to do wrong. My life verse, one of my life verses, he says this in Joshua 24, 15, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the regions beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Everyone, each of you, all of us, we are going to serve someone or something. You're going to have to make some choices. I have to make some choices. We have to set priorities. We have to make commitments. If we are going to be persons of influence in our households, in our families, in our church, in our community, in our schools, in our work. If we're going to be persons of influence, it's going to take effort and it's going to take commitment. This morning, I want to give you a couple opportunities to make commitments for this series. The first one is this. Many of you, I know, have not yet been part of a life group. So I want you to make a commitment to spending the next seven weeks in one of our life groups. I've got life group leaders here with us this morning. They're going to make their way around to the sides of the room. We've got tables set up where as you leave, we've built in time for you to, to have conversations with life group leaders. Commit to a life group. It may take rearranging a schedule. It may take changing some commitments. 
But if you are going to make spiritual development your priority, this is something that we believe you need to do. We want you to commit to a life group. You may have noticed that if you all were to go sign up today, our life groups, which we like to be from 8 to 12 people, would be more like 20 to 30 people. What I've done is this. Out at the Resource Center, perhaps you want to get together with some friends you know or some couples, some people in your neighborhood, and do your own study over the next seven weeks. You want to, in a, in a sense, lead your own life group for the next seven weeks. Sign up on the sheet out there for, for life group leaders, and I will email you the same material that goes out each week to these leaders. And you can study through this with a group on your own. Some of you have yet to know exactly, come to understand what New Life's mission, vision, core values are. You want to get involved with what God is doing here at New Life, but you don't yet know exactly where to begin. The first step, we have a class, the New Life Discovery class. I'm going to have a sheet out there, again, at the Resource Center for you to give me your uh, name, email address, phone number. And when we have enough people together to host the next class, I will get y'all together at a time that's you know, as convenient as can be for a group of people, and you will need to make a commitment to come and go through the discovery class with us. We want you to serve here at New Life. We want you to have influence in your family and community, and you want, we want you to help us continue to reach people who are far from God with the good news of Jesus Christ. 